And we are live. This is the Dev Book Club. Tonight I am joined by Martin and Bo, and we are going to talk about uh, Chapter 2 of Clean Code by Robert Martin. This chapter is about meaningful names, which I think is, you know, the running joke is naming is the hard, or one of the hardest things that we do as developers, which is true. I mean, see it all the time. So hopefully this chapter had some interesting tidbits. Um, everyone want to just, I'll just start with you, Martin, just... Brief introduction, say hi, who you are, where you are, whatever. So, Martin. Hi, I'm uh, Martin, uh, a human <laughs> uh, from Denmark. And uh, I'm trying to hopefully learn how to write clean code after this. Uh, or at least be better at it. Nice. And Bo? I'm Bo. I'm in Madison. And, yeah, I'm joining on Chapter 2. I, I skipped Chapter 1, and Jeff was kind enough to let me know I, I wasn't going to be too behind, so I'll have to get back to it. And I've let on that I've never read Clean Code before, unlike the last book we did where I had actually read it beforehand. <laughs> so I, I was excited. This I've heard a lot about this book, so I'm excited to uh, actually read it for the first time. Great. And I am Jeff, and I host this dev book club every once in a while. Um, <laughs> I actually did read chapter one, so I'm ahead of Bo in, in the book. So. Um, okay, so what is... Um, I'll start with you, I guess, Bo. We'll start with you. Um, what, what is one thing that you took out of, of this chapter as being interesting or new or noteworthy, whatever you want to call it? I think the thing that I liked the most about this was that there were a lot of little sections to read up on. Um, and there were a lot of things that I've either picked up on my own or heard over time, and it was just nice to see them collected in one spot. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I think I, I think that is one of the good things about this book in general is, or at least for me anyway, it's it is broken down in a very readable format. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, I, I, like you're saying, like a lot of it is, you know, depending on if you've been programming for a while, you've probably seen a lot of the problems that the book is addressing or you've learned um, you've learned some of the things like you were talking about where the book is now reinforcing some some ideas that you've had about how how things should be or how things should look mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's one of the cool things so it's like I don't know when I first read this book or this chapter even I was like well this is all kind of common sense right like this is something that I think everybody knows but it is definitely nice to have it written down just and presented in a format like it is so Mm -hmm. I agree with you there. I, I think that coming off of the implementing domain driven design book too, it was really nice to have something fun to read. Like I, I read it and I was like, wow, that was awesome and I got stuff out of it and <laughs> very <laughs> And it reads it reads pretty quickly too, so yeah. it's not I, I know with IDDD it was you know, eighty pages and you're just like it feels like eight hundred. Yeah. This one it's <laughs> You know, I, I got to the end of the chapter this time, and I read it, and I was like, wait, did I already finish the chapter? Like, that's, <laughs> how did I do that? Yeah. All right, and Martin, what is you, what is one thing you picked out? Yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah, kind of the same. I, I see the, it, it's one small subject in the whole chapter, but uh, really described very, very well. Um, and a lot of good examples. I really like the examples. It, it makes it really clear to see before and after a name change. Um, I like examples. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's a cool part, just looking at even even like the small in-sentence in examples that he used and and the, the more, I, I don't want to call them like more robust, but some of the larger, you know, they're like five lines in this chapter, but examples that he uses, you can really tell that either he had someone helping him significantly think up a bunch of bad examples, or you can tell that he's seen a lot of really bad code before, and so he was able to pick out just the perfect example that shows you, like, uh, one that stood out for me was that, I think it was like six or seven lines of code that was uh, looping through uh, some values, and it was or some sort of list, and it was trying to figure out you know, if this was like over a max value or something like that. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but uh, Eddie showed it the first time and he's like, what's wrong with this code? And, you know, really the answer is nothing. Like, there's there was nothing really wrong with it. Like, it is 
functionally correct and it's concise and it's it's pretty clear, but you can't really know what what it's doing until he went and replaced variable names and used constants and used some of the things that you're you're taught to do, and you look at it and immediately pick up on exactly what that code is doing, even though it's it's structurally exactly the same. Nothing changed but the names, and I think that was pretty cool. Yeah, I, th I think that was the, the Minesweeper example. I, I, re I really like that one, too, because he, he, he split it up in, in two. Uh, so he first showed a with really bad naming, and then one with a little better namings, and uh, the last example, he made a, a, an extra cell class to, yeah. to really show the difference. That yeah, that's right. That is that is what it was. It was the game. Yeah, you're right. Um, something that I took out, or something that I found interesting, um, was when he was talking about, you know, you're naming something. As you know, as a programmer, you should really think about the name that you're using and be careful not to use a word that has some sort of established meaning already. And the example that he was giving was um, having an account list, and you know, he's saying. You know, technically this is a list of accounts, but it's not actually a list. So as a programmer, especially, I mean, depending on what languages you've worked on and what type of structures you've used, that sort of thing, you may come into an application and see an account list and think, oh, this is a list. It should have these certain behaviors that a list would have, whereas really it's not actually a list. It's just, you know, a collection. So he's talking about, you know, how you should be wary of naming things of, with something that's already established as a concept. And so he's like, is this is this actually a list or is it just a bunch of accounts? So call it accounts and then you can iterate over them that way. And it's I, I think that was interesting because you know I've I've seen this before and I've done this before where it's like, you know, I named something an array and it was actually, you know, not an array. And <laughs> but you know, I mean it, it wasn't just array, but it was like it may have been an array at some point, but I changed it, so now the name is wrong. So it's you know disinformation, and it's named something that someone might expect to behave a certain way, and it doesn't. So it was just something that I found to be interesting to me. Yeah, I find myself doing account info quite a bit, or things along those lines. Yeah. And so that was that was interesting to see that that you don't have to add that. Um, I, Whatever uh, there were two types. There was the disinformation and the the noise. I don't remember what the noise one was called, but uh, also was um, just noise. Non-information maybe. Probably yeah. Non-information sounds right. Yeah. So I I, I like that a lot just to because I, I find myself doing that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also I also wrote down something kind of along those lines where. Um, you know, shorter names are generally better than longer ones, so don't add. It's I, I think he said like, uh, don't add more context than is necessary to get the point across. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I know I I have trouble with sometimes because I'm like, oh, well, let me name this as descriptively as possible. So you end up with, you know, method names that are like 30 characters long, and it's like I don't really want to mess with this. So, you know, pare it down. Like make it have just enough context so that someone gets it, and maybe that means you have to have 30 characters, but chances are you don't. Mm -hmm. So just think about what you're, what you're naming and, and pare it down into something that actually makes sense. Yeah. I like the example of, um, toward the end of that part where they, he talked about the, the different types of addresses. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was like you or I. It, like, at, at the end, it was like um, postal address, Mac, and you or I. And you know, I, I know I've had Mac address as a type before, <laughs> or as a as a property name. So I, I know I've done that. This is like the the joke of you know having an ATM machine. You know, people, I need yeah. to go to the ATM machine. You're like the last letter is literally machine. It's like yeah. it's for machine. You don't have an ATM automated teller machine machine. <laughs> so like you know, name your things appropriately. It makes it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I actually didn't know the M was, was for machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know. Yeah. See, look, you've learned something. <laughs> you learned nothing else. You know that it stands for automated teller machine. 
but but I'm also um, trying to be better at cutting down the names. Now I've I've started to to be descriptive in my names, and now I need to to cut it down a little. I think so. Make it I a little. A, I think it's a natural progression. I think as long as needed. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, something else that I found, or that I wrote down as as a quote, just you know, probably for myself more than anything else, was, um, if you can't pronounce it, you can't discuss it without sounding like an idiot, and programming is a social activity. And I, you know, he was talking about when you have you know abbreviations and you've got shortened things and you've got, uh, you know, you've got some sort of, I don't know, whatever. Like you've got something that becomes a joke. He he gave a couple examples of. Of, of variable names that became jokes where he where he'd worked and you know I think that's that's true because a lot of times well at least I've been in code bases before where you know, there may be something in there that it's just a, a mix of abbreviations so you're you're you know like, typically you're going to be three or four levels deep in a call stack and it's oh well I've got a little bit of data from everything above that's come into here so let me just combine them all together so you get this gobbledygook of a name and you're like I don't know what this actually means I don't know like who decided to call it this so that was something that stood out to me was you know think about when you're naming things and not just from that context but also since we do talk about code and talk about problems a lot any situation where you have you know uh, misinformation encoded in in your variable names or in your method names, like you maybe have, or you have something named incorrectly. Um, like an example that we have where I work, um, a long time ago, when someone was building the system, they created a uh, a database table called resort. And then, you know, because at the time, a, a resort was, you know, you could only have one type of product for a resort. So like the resort was the product. Well, now there's the concept of resorts and products, but resorts are products. And then there's another thing that is that is a resort. So now, whenever you talk to somebody, uh, when you're talking through the the language of, of the application, you're saying you're saying resort, but you could be meaning one of two things. So you always have to clarify it. Like you always have to say resorts as in products. And so like that's one of those things where it's like. When you're thinking about naming things, think about you know, you're going to have to discuss this for possibly a very long time if you're supporting this app for a long time. So make sure that the naming is sound. And when you have an opportunity, change it as soon as you have the problem as opposed to letting it fester for years because then you end up with something that you can't change easily. Yeah. And the last thing you said, that was actually, us, that was actually something I... I wrote down as the first thing. Uh, yeah, change the names when you when you find a better name. So so don't just let it sit there and be a bad name. We have good editors now that can easily change the name. So just do it when you see a bad name. Yeah. Bo, you look like you have something revolutionary to tell us. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily revolutionary, but uh, one of the things that um, I remembered thinking about when I was reading this was the, the idea of context. Um, mm -hmm. so if you're in a specific namespace, um, I, I, I often run into the problem of not knowing how much context I should embed in the class name as well, Like, uh, especially if we're talking about like implementing different types of... Uh, or, doing different implementations of an interface. Like if I've already put the uh, PDO repository in implementation inside a PDO sub namespace, should I say PDO account repository? You know, uh, because you can, you can make a, the argument that you're already in the PDO sub namespace, so clearly it's going to be a PDO account repository. <laughs> uh, so so I, it didn't, I don't think the chapter really touched on that too much. Uh, but that was one thing that I know that I thought about again as something that recurs for me when it comes to naming is you know the the idea of context and the namespace or package that you're in mm -hmm. uh, versus what you actually put in the class name. I don't know if anyone else has run into that. 
I I have actually, and um, on on that like my so this is my opinion. Like this isn't like the book's opinion. <laughs> uh, I think I I agree with what um, he said in in the chapter about you know when you've got an interface and an implementation that he he falls in the side where he's going to not not decorate. I think that that may have been the word he used, but not mm-hmm. decorate the um, Interface with like an I or interface after he's not going to change the name because when you when you're using it in code, you're saying I'm going to pass you an account repository, not an I account repository or I'm not passing you an interface. I'm passing you something that is a account repository that, that mm-hmm. it provides this behavior and then decorate the the class name. So from my perspective, if I'm in a if I'm in a sub namespace and I've already got that. Kind of encoded there. I would probably just go with account repository inside PDO, mm-hmm. except if I was worried about having to alias things. So, like one of the one of the problems I think with that is you end up in a situation where you've got. Um, well, I guess you would never have two account repositories in the same place, so it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. But you're you're referencing an account repository, and it's difficult to keep track of whether you're referencing the idea of the interface or you're referencing the actual implementation. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think it would be beneficial, but I I personally would, if I already have a package that's containing the name or some sort of context for what this is, I wouldn't bother with adorning the actual class name. Mm-hmm. What, yeah, do you, I, what do you do? I, I, I go back and forth on it, personally. <laughs> uh, I, I try to stay consistent within a package, but every time I start a new package, I feel like I have that same discussion with myself and okay. then pick one way or the other to go for that package. Um, I haven't really standardized on what I what Bo always does anytime he creates a new package. The Bo technique. Yeah, the Bo technique. That could be a the Bo methodology. That could be like a book or something. I think <laughs> I think you should get started on that. Nice. Oh, let me see if the domain's available. <laughs> Um. Yeah, I think uh, so. Another uh, another thing along along those lines that I wrote down was um, distinguish distinguish the names of things in such a way that the reader is going to understand the distinction that each offers. And I don't remember the exact example that he used in in the in the chapter, but that kind of stuck or you know stuck out to me in terms of you know you've got some tiny difference in, in the way things are and. I should probably go look up what his exact example was, but you know, you've got these two two concepts or two variables or two classes or something. Make it extremely clear what the difference is between them. Like um, this may have been when he was using the a uh, a um, tree versus the tree example, or uh, it wasn't tree, but whatever it was. But make sure that people are aware when they're just reading your code. What the difference between those two things are. So don't don't be so generic that nobody can guess. And it's just um, this was probably around the same time when he was talking about not using numbers um, as as a way to get around compilers is what he was saying. But you know you you've got this variable like oh well now I'm inside inside the loop so let me just call it um, object one and then I'll be set. I've got object two and I, you know. Don't use that because it's it's not information. It doesn't actually convey what your intent was. Yeah, th- this was where it was product info and product data. Like, if you have two variables that you've just decided that, well, I need two that are sort of called the same thing, so I already have product info, so this one will be product data. <laughs> uh, like, what's what's the difference between them? Yeah, that that was that, I think that was the thing I was mentioning earlier that I. I picked up that I, I do product info and product data and you know weird things like that that add noise. So that, that's where he says noise words. Noise words. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then another another thing that's kind of along those lines is um, he was talking about the difference between a smart programmer and a professional programmer. He said the difference would be that a a professional programmer understands that clarity is is king, and so he or she writes um, code that other people are going to be able to understand. 
And and then one of the examples I wrote down that really stuck out to me is you know just do you know what the function holy hand grenade does? Like do you know what it does? Like you you run across a call to holy hand grenade inside your application. What does that do? Does that you know shut down the system? Like what does that <laughs> what does that function do? And I I was thinking you know because that was the part where he's talking about like don't try to be too clever because you're depending on other people understanding your humor. And yeah, sure, it's funny in that pull request, you know, today, and your, you know, your colleagues laugh and like, oh, this is great, this is hilarious. Then three months from now, you've got holy hand grenade littered throughout your code base, and you're like, what does that do exactly? Does that throw a 500, or does that? I don't remember what this thing does. So name things what they are, as opposed to what you find clever based on your culture or whatever. It truncates the database. <laughs> That is what I would expect Holy Hand Grenade to do, actually. <laughs> but about the, the the prefixes in naming, I when he mentioned um, using A and the, mm -hmm. he talks about he used uh, A for all local variables and the, the as a prefix for all function arguments. I, I actually like like that that idea. Um, if, if the editor doesn't really distinguish between them, I think it could be a, give a great uh, overview over the function. Yeah, I think if that's if that's something that you wanted to adopt, like I, I personally don't do that, but you know, I could I can see how that might have usefulness within yeah. within a system. Yeah, I I don't do it, but I, I I've never thought of the idea. To, to distinguish between, between the, those two types of variables, but maybe I should try to get PHPs down to color them, different, them differently and see how it is. I think my, my issue with that would be it would remind me too much of this and that and those, the tricks that you do in JavaScript to, to deal with context. Oh. Like it would remind me too much of that, like, I have to keep track of where this came from because because the language is so terrible or because it's difficult to keep track of this. So I need I need this as a crutch. I think that would be my only hesitation for it. Is I don't always yeah. feel like I need that, but I I can see how it could be valuable. Um, another thing that I found interesting uh, was when he was talking about um, since you are a programmer, since you are a developer. Um, it's okay to choose technical names for technical things and to use use language from the solution space rather than the, the problem space. And this kind of, I don't know, like I, I kind of have a little bit of issue with it to some degree, but I understand his point. And his point was that, you know, as, as developers, we're the ones who are reading the code. So when you come in and you see a job queue, I think that was the example I used, you know exactly what that's going to do as opposed to calling it um, the master list or, you know, something. Like whatever, I don't know what your business would call a job queue, but, you know, something. So, but then on the other side, he talked about, you know, using things from the solution space inside the code base as much as possible, um, deep, I guess deep inside. I, he, he made some distinction, but, um, and that's just so that developers don't have to go back to a domain expert to, to, you know, beg them to explain what this particular concept is or what this is called inside the code base or whatever. And I, I see that, but I also think that we could probably take that a little too far if you if you wanted to. You could say, well, like, you know, this is... I'm not going to call this this because there's a better technical name for it. So I think that's good advice. Like, when when it makes sense to do so, it's good advice. But I can easily see this going way overboard and you just have such a disconnect between what the business is going to call something and what you're calling it internally just because you feel like it's a better name. Yeah. I, I actually thought about that too. Um, it, it's a little against the the DDD book uh, you talked about last where you should name things um, like the domain. Um, but yes, in the same in the same language. Yeah, but I was actually a little unsure what he actually meant because the the first 
paragraph he talks about the use solution uh, solution the name domain names and then the next paragraph he, he says the exact opposite I'm not really I'm not really sure what what he actually meant by by those two sections. Um, oh, when he says use solution domain names and then use problem domain names. Yeah, I think I think what his point was is, um, we so there there is a distinction between something that's purely a technical concept or purely a technical solution to something and it has a good name that will tell somebody what it is. So this would be something where you're um, you're dealing with like a a type of or you're dealing with something that needs to be sorted so you you name something that has you know bubble sorted and if you're using bubble sort or you know you name something with a an established patterns like you know a factory or um, whatever. And then so that is that is something that applies in the solution space. That's how you got there. The business probably isn't going to call the same thing, so I think what he was making in this, or the distinction he was making here, is um, when you're when you're dealing with something that is only how you're doing it in code, um, because you have to solve this particular problem. That's when you would pull from the solution space, the solution domain, in order to figure out what the name is or what to name something. And then if you're dealing with something that is not a, it's not something that is a characteristic of just because you're writing it in code that you're you're making this thing or you're naming this thing, that's when you would err on the side of using something with a problem domain. At least that's what I kind of took it from because you're, you know, it's not, it doesn't exist solely because it's something you're writing in code. It exists because of the business, and that's when you would make that that call. I don't know. Maybe I misunderstood his point, but that's that's kind of what I took out of that. Yeah, it makes sense. It was one of the sections that sort of popped up for me as well as being, it seemed a little vague or contradictory to the ubiquitous language concept. Yep. Uh, but he, he does make a, make a point of saying that um, part of the job of a programmer, of, of a good programmer and designer, is to know when to use which. Um, but again, it seems like a very vague thing to throw out there for people to be like, oh yeah, that depending on the way you lean, um, you're going to pick this up as being either, oh yeah, I should always use the technical names for things, um, or oh, I should always use the business name for things. Mm -hmm. um, it just seemed like a, a really ambiguous thing to throw out there as a, a guiding thing that doesn't really help you very much. Yep. So I guess from that, that means I'm not a good programmer because I can't I can't tell you right off the cuff when you would use <laughs> either. Like I think it's situationally dependent. So I'm not a good programmer. Good to know. Thanks, Uncle Bob. Um, let me see if there's anything else that I wrote down. Already covered all these. Oh, no, I think oh, that's it. one thing. Yeah. I, I quote from the book, you know, from the chapter. If the name requires a comment, then the name that does not reveal its intent. I think that's a really important quote. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I thought his example was kind of perfect. You know, you've got I think he had a date and he just called it D. Yeah. And then immediately after the semicolon it was like the date this was created or whatever. And you're just like, why would you not call it create a date or something? Like uh, what is wrong with you? Like why would you put D? Are you saving characters? I don't understand. But yeah, I think that is that is something that's important to take away, and it, it's not always going to be as trivial trivial as that. But it's going to be something like, well, in in that example I gave earlier, you've got a resort, and so you call it resort, but then you have a comment after that, the product that blah blah blah. And you're like, why wouldn't you just change it to what the actual name is at that point? Why did you spend the effort writing the comment to clarify? Obviously, this confused you. So why not just change the name so someone else can can benefit from it? Yeah, that 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 puzzles me sometimes that people do that, <laughs> write a, a weird name and describe describe it with three lines of comments. <laughs> yeah, 
you end up reading a story about why it's named poorly, and you're just like, <laughs> at this point, I'd rather you have it. just named it correctly. Thanks. Thanks for the story, though. Yeah, I think I think this chapter was, you know, for me, it was kind of a lot of head nodding for the most part. There were a couple, like the, the ubiquitous language or the, the problem space, domain space, or problem space, solution space thing, that kind of... I think I I I try I think I understand what he was saying, but that was really the only thing that stuck out at me as something I would disagree with um, in in this particular chapter. I think everything else is kind of yeah I, I agree with that. Did anybody else have anything you disagreed with or question? I had the exact same reaction. Nodded the whole way until that section, and then was flat. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Well, cool. So I guess we're all great at meaningfully naming things. Oh, I didn't say that. No. <laughs> but, but we know how to. Yeah. <laughs> we know some basic rules. Yeah. Um, okay, so is there... So I did this last time, but is there anything that you... Or what is one thing that you're going to take away from this chapter and try to apply to your... Uh, daily programming life. Uh, for me, so I'll start to give you a couple of seconds to think of, of what you want, but for me, um, I think you mentioned this a little earlier, Martin, but um, he said something like, you know, surprise your coworkers by, by you know, changing the name or changing names of, of stuff that you see that's bad, and you, you may get some resistance when you're doing it, so, you know, you're working in, in a method squashing some bug or something, and you're like, oh, this is named confusingly. Just let me just change it. So you change it inside the whole the whole class or whatever. And you may get some resistance from people saying, you know, why are you messing with that? You know, this is already in there. You were fixing this other bug. This is not related. And you're like, well, I changed the name because it made more sense. Be it's going to pay off for you. I think is what he said in there that, you know, even if you have to fight the battle, it will pay off in the long run for not only you but for everyone else. So fight that battle and actually do it. So it's something I'm going to try to do. If I, when I run across things that I feel like need to be changed, I'm going to change them and see, see what happens. See how happy I am after a month or so. What about you, Martin? I think uh, actually, I think I'm going to work more on the the, the naming part, the f figuring out a, a good name. I think I, I, I really have trouble finding out what, what I should name things. I know what it does and, and that, but how can I describe that as short and clear as possible? Um, I think that's that's pretty hard sometimes, at least. So, so are you going to like integrate it into your general development workflow somehow? Are you going to you know? I'm going to finish something and then I'm going to go back and just read through it again as if I was, you know, a new person coming into this and figure out if anything needs to be named more clearly. Yeah, that, that's actually actually a, a really good idea. Uh, pr proofreading the the names. And <laughs> that's <laughs> name. <laughs> proofreading Go. That's a tough one. I know I I struggle with that a lot. I'm like, oh, I'm finally finished with this. All right, it looks. Somewhat decent, I'm done. And then you get to code review and you're like, oh, I probably should have changed that. Should have changed that. Uh, that's not the best. Oh, well. Yeah, I, I could totally see that. And Bo, what about you? Oh. And Bo, what about you? Um, I think that I'm going to pay more attention to the boys' words. I'm going to be more intentional about that aspect of naming because that's something that I know in the past I've struggled with. Um, I, I recently switched, well, somewhat recently switched to uh, PHP Storm mm -hmm. from VI and Sublime Text specifically for uh, the refactoring capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm trying to get more comfortable with that. I would say just in the last two weeks, I finally, finally memorized Shift F6 to rename variables, and nice. um, I've been using it pretty uh, liberally over the last couple of weeks, I would say. So nice. um, I'm going to continue to do that and maybe clean up some code over the next you know, couple of weeks, months, or whatever. You can just change the hotkey if it's too annoying. <laughs> well, I I, there was no hotkey for it before. It was grep and do things by hand. So 
Ah. Auf meinem Control Shift A. Hm. Nice. PHP stuff is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I use it for I I use Vim most of the time. Um, but I I do use when I'm when I'm in something and I'm like, oh I need to just clean this up, that's when I fire up PHP Storm. I don't uh, I don't know, I, I just I like the the workflow that I've kind of set up for myself is, you know, I'm inside Tmux and I've got got things open. So I could do all of it in PHP Storm. I, I know I can, but I'm just set in my ways and I like my my Vim configuration. I think part of it is just because I spent so much time building it up to where it is right now that I don't want to be like, oh, there's something much better than this. Like I'm just stuck in it. I'm like, this I've invested so much, I'm not throwing this away. So I don't know, that could be it. Who knows? I um, tried me once. I, I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's my problem. Maybe I tried it once ten years ago and I just never left. So maybe that's it. <laughs> Didn't figure out how to quit, so I'm still using it. Um, yeah. So I I don't think that I have anything else. Is there any other comments or questions, whatever you wanna wanna say about this chapter? No, Throughout no, no. this whole chapter, I have in mind a problem that I had before that I'll come clean on. Um, at a more macro level, I used to name projects after weird things, not descriptive at all. Um, and for a little while, I had uh, a bunch of modules that were named after Adult Swim characters. And uh, in the case where there were clients and servers, they would be paired, like actual like characters that would actually talk to each other. Um, and I thought it was cute and clever, and I think that was one of the section headings was don't be cute or don't be yep. clever. Sure. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of encoding and a lot of uh, outside knowledge that you would have to have on these, these characters to know why was this one named a certain thing. Um, so I, I've since then not done that. <laughs> yeah, I've, <laughs> I've moved beyond that, and I'm a little more, little more descriptive of the modules that I've uh, been creating, but I've worked with other people who have done things like that now, and uh, it, it drives me crazy because I know yep. where that leads. <laughs> um, yep. We, I mean, they, they had to create a meta document just to, to map that that's what this, what this project does this. <laughs> it's like, well, I'll just name the project that. Um, yeah. So it, it goes all the way down to like a really low level, this problem of naming, but it also goes at a really high level. Um, like, whole applications could be named the wrong thing just for fun, and, and I've, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> yep, totally been that's, there and experienced it all the time. <laughs> Re renaming a project is a little harder than just renaming a variable. Yep, it is. Yeah, it is. I, I think, yeah, it's, it's pretty rough. And I think this is one of the interesting things, because we actually encourage people to, to name things crazily. Um, in terms of, you know, you've got you've got some libraries, some packages you want to get out. So you've got to come up with a creative name for it so you can get the .io or the, the .com or whatever. So you've got to come up with some name for it. So now you've got, you know, something else. And you're like, oh, what's, what's this going to be? So, you know, back in the day, you know, you needed a, you needed something that was going to, you know, make an HTTP request. So you called it, you know, curl, C-U-R-L. Like, you know, it was something that was like, this made sense. But now you're like, oh, I need... I need somebody who's going to make HTTP requests. What am I going to call it? I know I'll call it uh, cup mustard or something. Like you've got to come up with something insane just to be able to name your project that. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that I loathe about the uh, Ruby Gems ecosystem because it's like <laughs> you can go have conversations with people and be like, "Oh, what's your stack?" And they can name you fifty things and you have no idea what they do unless you've read them before. Like they're like, "Oh, well, I use." I use a uh, unicorn, and I use and you're just like, okay, what do all those do? And unless you unless you're involved in it, you have no clue what they're talking about. Like it's just totally insane. It's like, what's wrong with calling an HTTP server, you know, HTTP server, or you know, what's wrong with calling an HTTP client in inside my application, HTTP client? Like what's wrong with that? I know exactly what it is and what it does at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally been there. Probably still am there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the cute naming thing, that's that's another fun one with uh, systems names. Mm. Like, 
I still name all of my computers after you know Egyptian uh, Egyptian mythological beings. And, mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of funny because Davy Shefik, he also he also used to have a computer named the same thing as mine. And I found this out because we were at uh, Lone Star PHP one year, and I joined the hotel Wi-Fi, and it changed the name of my computer to uh, it was Horus Dash Two, because <laughs> his was also named Horus. that. And I'm just like, what's up with that? So I, I asked, you know, who has their computer named this? And he was like, oh, I do. I was like, fantastic. And it's funny because we had the same problem where I used to work, where two different groups were naming their servers after um, one of them was colors and one of them was fruits. When they got to orange, there was a disagreement. So, like, they're trying to figure out which one of them got to keep orange as, you know, orange dot whatever it was. But it, it's funny because it's like I tend to err on, on that side of things, especially in a professional environment. I will name something, you know, web server or www-001 or something. And it's like very clear that that is a web server. Whereas someone else may name it Treebeard, and it will be Treebeard forever. And you're like, what? What does Treebeard do? Well, it serves <laughs> serves websites, of course. Everyone knows that. So yeah, it's 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 a fun naming game. I enjoy it. Um, I think I'm I'm not really that creative with namings <laughs> either. I, I just name things. Yeah, what they are. Or if I can't figure out a name, it's just test and dummy and that kind of stuff, and then a lot of numbers after if I already have one. Well, I think you'll go far with that attitude. Just, <laughs> just my my prediction. Except for the test and dummy thing. Well, T- test three hundred or, or something just keeps going. Yeah, I actually found a um, an article not too long ago. Long ago. Um, called a proper server naming scheme that went into great detail about this, including a list of um, generic names that you can use uh, so that you don't have to, like if you name a box Treebeard, like you're intentionally naming it tree, Treebeard. And uh, what, what the idea behind this naming scheme was, was getting you a list of easily spoken usable names that were short that had no meaning whatsoever. Um, so that you could name individual boxes a certain thing, and you would never be able to reuse that name. But it, the, the name itself meant nothing. It was kind of it was kind of an interesting approach. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Hmm. So you you don't have to remember a lot of numbers and such. Yeah, the, I mean, the, there were a lot of things that went into it, uh, like like. Um, adding like uh, other more descriptive names on top of it, but the actual name of the host itself could be, you know, like some of the names in here, like Crimson, Melody, Verona, Banjo. I mean, just these really short, easy to remember names that, you know, someone says Crimson's down, okay, you go to Crimson, and it doesn't mean anything to you necessarily. Um, like there was no thought that went into it, and you didn't have to worry about the, the pool of names being used up, like, oh, I've got, I've got this box name, that, and that's a really cool name, I wish that name could be used for this other server over there or something. Like, I never had to worry about that. <laughs> nice. Oh, I mean, this person never had to worry about that. I haven't implemented it myself yet. But... Nice. All right, well, I, I think that's it. Um, any closing, any last remarks? Done here. Done, okay, done. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for joining tonight. Um, that was the second chapter of the book. We're going to be covering the third chapter, um, which is uh, functions. So functions are next. That should be fun. That should actually be a fun one, I think. I hope. Um, so we're going to cover that one next in two weeks. Same time. Hopefully no one is complaining about conferences at that point. So. That's where everyone is today, I think. Or at least that's where Adam is. But yeah, Adam and Eric and Jeremy. So they'll probably join us next time. Hopefully. So that's it. Uh, Chapter 3 is next time, two weeks from today.